Morning, everybody. I just want to say, if anybody is going to come and kick me in the shins today, you're going to get kicked back. I don't know why my wife laughed so hard when he said that at the beginning of that video, but it happens. Um, Eric and me are really nice to each other when you guys aren't around. I promise. Uh, we're going to we're going to continue this this sermon series. Who's your one today? And I wanted to get into this just uh, and kind of ask you: Have you ever had? Uh, one of those moments where you're watching a TV show or you're watching a movie, and this aha moment comes around. And, like, the whole movie or the whole show was playing up to this one part where all of a sudden everything else from, the, from back here, it made sense and it became significant. There was one movie that I remember watching when I was younger. I was in college. And I'm going to preface this by saying I've stopped watching these kinds of, of movies because they're horror movies and they scare me. Like, I, just, I don't... I almost wet the bed sometimes. Like, I just get so scared from, from scary movies. The last one I really watched was, um, I think it was called What Lies Beneath with Harrison Ford. Don't watch it. It's awful. It's terrifying. But this, there's one movie where there's this aha moment, and it's this movie called si The Sixth Sense. And it's, it's a fairly older movie, and so I'm going to probably, if you've never watched it, I'm not worried that you're going to, and I'm going to give you a little spoiler on this one. But this movie is about a kid who sees dead people. That right there tells you all that you need to know. It's just, that's stupid, that's awful, it's like the scariest thing ever. And so this kid starts going to a therapist because if you are seeing dead people, you probably should go to a therapist. So he goes to this therapist and the, the movie starts to actually kind of revolve around this therapist. Um, and everything seems to be kind of normal other than the fact that this kid sees dead people. And they're going through this story and then at the end of the movie, there's this huge curveball thrown because the kid is talking to this therapist and he's like, uh, the reason I see you is because you're dead. And the guy had no clue. He didn't see that coming. And you didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming throughout the whole movie. And then all of a sudden, this is where the fun part happens is the movie flashes back to all these scenarios that this therapist has been going through uh, throughout the movie. And you start to see that in every situation, he thinks that he is in this world where he's communicating with people, but nobody sees him because he's dead. And it's this, this crazy aha moment that, that happens in that movie. And all these things that happened in the first part of the movie, they, seemed, they didn't seem all that significant. And then once you, you kind of get the, the curveball thrown at you, you realize that everything else was, was super significant. And we have situations like that in our lives, with, in relationships with people where things that happen that we don't think is all that significant, later on down the road, we see how significant they are. Um, my wife, the first time that she ever talked to me, she asked me what time it was. She didn't know she was talking to the man of her dreams. Seemed like an insignificant moment, but it was like life-changing, life-altering. There's another situation I remember, uh, seems somewhat insignificant. I was going to school at UW La Crosse because Crystal was there. I, yeah, I followed her there for a year before I went to Bible school. And I was about to, we're getting to the end of that school year and I was going to be going to Bible school the next year. And her roommate tells me, hey, there's a couple guys I went to high school with who are going to that same Bible school that you're about to go to. You should look them up sometime. Got their names and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on reaching out to them and like, hey, we know the same person. Let's be friends. Like, I don't do that kind of thing. And so Never met them in college, but then me and one of those guys, his name was Ben, we started, um, we ended up being youth pastors, and we were taking kids to the same Bible camp in the summer, and so we're there, and we got, we were, we kind of got to know each other at that camp, and we, we known each other for about three days, and he gets this wild idea at the end of the camp, I have to go up on stage, and, and I was the rec director, and I had to tell everybody, like, who won uh, the, the camp, as far as what, what team color won the camp, and so he's like, hey, let's do it really fun. How about you go in as, as my dummy and I'll be a ventriloquist and you just sit on my lap and I'll, I'll say all the wor words. And, and I'm stupid enough that I actually did it. And so this guy, the big strong guy, like carries me in on, on his shoulders and plops me on Ben's lap and I just sit there and, and mouth out words. I had no clue what Ben was going to say or anything. It was crazy. And all this stuff, it seemed really insignificant, but um, we ended up, over, over the next like 12 years, we became best friends. And I look back now, even on Crystal's roommate telling me about, hey, I need to meet this guy. And it seemed so insignificant at the time. But in hindsight, it, it's something I still remember. It's a significant thing. 
it's hard for us not to treat everyday moments as just that. Everyday moments that don't matter, don't mean much. Uh, the awful things that I said to my kids today, are they really go- is it really going to stunt their emotional growth from this point forward? Uh, the, the person that I had to ignore today because I just couldn't deal with them, is it, is it really going to affect my ability to have a significant impact in their life a year from now? The person that I treat awfully at the restaurant today after church, is, is it really, they don't know I'm a Christian, is it really going to affect how they might see Jesus in their own life at some point? And I think about all these insignificant things that we go through, seemingly insignificant things we go through each and every day, and the truth is, is I have an awful attitude about it so much of the time, because I see it as insignificant. And the question I think we need to consider asking ourselves this morning is, is there any, any interaction whatsoever with another human being that is insignificant? Do we have any interactions with other people that we should ever see as being insignificant? How would my interactions with people change if I started to look at them as though they are situations that have an eternal consequence to it? See, that's the thing with Jesus. The way that he interacted with people, he always saw the, the eternal side of things. He always saw that there was a bigger consequence to, to, to this moment than just what maybe meets the eye. Everything has meaningful consequences, and those could be good and they could be bad. And, and Jesus treated all these circumstances in his life, things that we would see as seemingly insignificant, and he treated with them with the proper care. And one of those, one of those stories that we're going to look at today where, where Jesus does exactly that It's a story from Mark chapter 5 about a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. And so I'm going to start in this. It's about 11 verses, so it might be a little longer than some of them are, but it starts this way. It says, So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. Now, you don't know. I'm just going to stop for a second. You don't know who this him is yet, maybe. Uh, But I I wanted to make sure to read this because we're going to come back to this in a while. You don't know the context of who this guy is that Jesus is following? Uh, But it'll come back and and you'll see it's important. And then picking up in verse 25. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors who had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the truth, the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. How many times do you think Jesus just was casually, haphazardly touched while he was walking in a, in a crowd, in a crowded street in a city? How many times do you think just in this one instance, people were bumping into him and touching him while, while they were walking by him? Yet for some reason, Jesus picks out the touch of this one woman, this gentle tug on his clothes. I think to the rest of us, this would have seemed like a really insignificant thing, this, this woman touching him like this. But to him, it was anything but insignificant. The sensitivity that Jesus has in this, in this story is something that we need, we need to take a look at. He's able to, to differentiate between a casual, uh, maybe not even on purpose kind of a touch that most of this crowd is, is giving him. He's able to differentiate that from this tug of faith that this woman pulls on his cloak. And that's, that in and of itself is a fascinating thing. We've been talking about uh, who's your one this series. And really what we're, what we're asking is, who's that one person that, that is on your heart to, to make a significant impact in? And really, I think more accurately, who is that one person that God is putting on your heart to help them see who Jesus is? Who's that one person that God's asking you to make a personal connection with uh, for an eternal purpose? And this was a one-on-one story that Jesus has with a woman. And I think it, it shows us a little bit about who Jesus' one is. 
And so I want us to dive a little bit deeper into this story right now. Who, who exactly is this woman who, who touches Jesus' clothes? She is a woman who, the, the story says, she's been bleeding for 12 years. Uh, most, most commentators say that likely what is going on here is she has some kind of uterine disease, and it's causing her to bleed for 12 straight years. Now, that has got to be awful, I'm guessing. Never been through that, but I'm guessing it's awful. And it's not just awful from a physical standpoint. It's actually probably, if she were able to tell us, it's, it's probably even worse from a, a social standpoint or from a religious standpoint. Because, you see, uh, for, for Judaism, everything was tied so closely to their religion. And so this woman, she couldn't go past the outer co- court of the temple because she was unclean. She was bleeding. But not only that, she couldn't touch anybody else because she would make them unclean because of this bleeding issue that she's got going on. And so socially, she's like an outcast. Religiously, she's an outcast. And then one day, Jesus comes into her town, walking on the streets of her neighborhood. And she decides that she needs to approach him. And so she approaches him cautiously because, again, she's unclean. She doesn't want anybody to, to, to know that it's her. But Jesus is her last hope. She has spent every last penny that she has on every single doctor that she can possibly go to. She has gone to the far, the far outer reaches of the human mind, of science, to try to get healing from this issue that she's got. And out of all this, the thing that looks most legit to her at this point is Jesus. This woman had looked to the world for her answer, but the answers had left her worse off than when she had started. Have you ever felt like you've been in that place? You're looking for all the answers, and it seems like it's in all the wrong places. You've, maybe you've gone to the doctor before, and doctor, doctor after doctor hasn't been able to give you an answer for what's going on in your body. And then you finally get to a, to a doctor who, who says something that makes sense, and for like a month or two, you're thinking, man, I, things, this, is, this is it. And then after, after that month or two, you're like, yeah, that's still not the answer. I've kind of felt that way a couple times with some issues with our kids. In the, in the doctor. And it's this point of just utter desperation. Uh, a couple years back, I, when we were still living up in Manaqua, we had one of those northern Wisconsin winters where I think we had like 80 inches of snow dumped on us, and it was awful. And so spring comes along, and so you've got tons of snow melt, which puts a lot of water in the ground. And then on top of that, we had a ton of rain that spring for whatever reason. And so what happened is the water table in, around our home started to get really high. And I go downstairs in the basement one morning, and there is water in various different spots. Talk about desperation. I went through, like, I was desperate to get this water out of my basement for the next, like, month. And there were a couple moments where it was, it had gotten so frustrating, I was actually getting up every two and a half or three hours of the night. I was setting my alarm. See, I'd gone, I'd gone and gotten all the towels that I could. I, every single towel in my house, every single extra towel in my mom and dad's house, I had probably like 100 towels, and I would just put them in all these places where all these leaks were going. And then I would, I would get up about every two and a half to three hours. I'd even come home from work when it was really bad, and I would take about half the towels, I'd put them in our dryer, put them on the spin cycle, take the towels that were in that dryer, and I would put them out on the floor to try to dry stuff up. I went and bought a shop vac vacuum to soak everything up. I, I got quick, uh, that quick dry stuff, cement stuff, to try to cover up anything that was where leaks were coming in. I had a guy put a second sump pump in my, in my basement, all because when they built the house, they didn't put drain tile around the outside. And so I was, tr- I was constantly battling this water that was coming in. I have never felt more desperate in my entire life. Like, it was a month of awfulness for me. And I should have probably just let it go and let water just sit in my basement. I don't know. But we have these moments where, where it's like every answer that we have, every answer that I, I tried to come up with to make this, this issue go away, it, it just made me feel more desperate. And there are people in, in living around us in their daily lives where it's like they're trying to answer all of their problems in life with answers that only leave them feeling worse afterwards. You've got your neighbor who's working more and more hours all the time, thinking that happiness is going to finally come about when he's, 
when, when his bank account is flush with so much cash. But all this working is just kind of leaving him feeling empty and leaving him feeling lonely, more so than he was before. Or maybe your parents are, are getting a little bit older now, and, and they're trying, they want to do whatever they can to get the most out of the years left that they have in life. But the more money they spend, the more trips that they go on, they come back and it's like, it's, something's just still empty. Or you got kids who they're trying every brand of fashion and they're, they're constantly trying to be on an online connection with their friends, trying to get, make pe- have people feel like they're important. But there's still, there's just something, those answers are not answering the real needs. There are certain answers in life that they really only can be answered by this Jesus that this woman went to. Sometimes we get to the point where we just have, all we have left to do is to go and tug on the cloak of Jesus. It's this point of desperation. And this woman, she was constantly bleeding. She came from behind Jesus because she didn't want anybody to know it was her. And so, so she came up and she snuck up to Jesus because it was, he was her only hope left. She was desperate and she needed a real answer. Have you ever felt like you're in need of of a real answer that can actually give you the answers that you need? Do you feel like you know somebody that they're, they're in need of some kind of real answer and the only answer, it's something that they haven't found in this world? Jesus is the answer for people who are desperate in heart. But the question is, why is he the answer? Why is Jesus a better answer than the stuff that we find around us? So let's go back to the, the story of this woman for, for a minute. In her desperation... She hears that Jesus has come to her town, and everybody's like, this guy's healing everybody. Everything that he's, everything that he's doing, it just, it, he makes it better. And so she's, she's there thinking, man, I have, I have spent every money on doctors. I've done every conventional thing that there is that I could possibly do. She's probably done every unconventional thing. She's probably gone on every diet and visited every guru that she possibly can to try to get better, and nothing has worked. And she's at the point where this is her last hope. She might as well give it a shot. And so she begins following after this, this large crowd. And I can imagine she's standing, she's standing off way back behind the crowd. She's probably covered her face. She's done whatever she can to kind of make sure that nobody, her identity is concealed. Because if somebody sees who she is, they may go, hey, what are you doing here? If you touch us, we're unclean. Get, get away. So she sneaks in. She sneaks in through the crowd. And, and I imagine this crowd has gotten so big at this point. Because the crowds that would follow Jesus would, would be tight and they'd be big. And he's probably gotten to the point where, where it's, been, it's tough to even go any, any further. This whole crowd has slowed Jesus down to the point where it's, it's like a crawl. And so she starts to weasel her way in through this crowd. And she gets a little closer to Jesus and a little closer to Jesus. And she's almost there. And so now she, she drops her hands and knees and she starts crawling through, these, through all these legs to just get close enough to where she finally is able to reach out her hand And she touches this cloak of Jesus. And immediately, she knows that she's been healed. Can't imagine how, what that would have felt like for her. Immediately, she knows that she's better. But Jesus also knows that something's happened. Jesus realizes, even though he's being touched by all these people, something significant is happening at this moment. What he knows that nobody else knows is that this is a moment where eternity is hanging in the balance. He has got to get to this woman who has touched him. He's got to let her know that it's her faith that's healed her. It's her faith in God that has brought her healing. And so he, he decides he's got to make a personal connection with her. And what happens here is this woman's faith becomes an immediate emergency to Jesus. I want you to understand, it's not, it's not her healing. It's not her physical body that's become the emergency. It's her faith that's become the emergency. He sees an emergency like nobody else sees right now at this moment. And so this woman, this woman just wanted a physical healing. But Jesus meant to offer her something so much better. I think so many times in life, that's, I've found myself in that place where I've wanted something, but Jesus has wanted something so much better. Uh, I have, all of my life, I have been, my wife says that I am sort of an intense person. Um, I'm way over competitive. When, when my kids do something that I really like, I, I do this weird thing where I, I go, I clench my teeth and I'm like, oh, I just want to hug you. 
And I don't know where that comes from. And I've passed it on to my daughter, Abby. I don't, but I, I've got this intensity. It, it was so bad. When I was a kid, they literally called me Tornado on the playground because I'd be playing a game, I'd get mad, and then I would just become this raging lunatic who all of a sudden, it, but it was crazy. I was like this little person who all of a sudden had like superhuman power. It was awesome. But my, my competitiveness is, it's, it, it's, not, it's not always been a great thing. I've always thought that I have to win at all costs. Uh, and, and actually, when I used to play basketball, I thought I never could get more competitive than that. And then I started coaching basketball, and I realized, oh, that competitiveness even has another notch. Um, I, there was something about, like, when I was playing, I, I could control what I was doing. But when I was coaching, I was like, I felt like I was in charge. How those kids played, it mattered all on me. And I couldn't sleep at night when we would lose. When we were in the middle of a game, man, I could just get so angry. I got three technical fouls. Only two of them were out of anger. So it wasn't too bad. But I remember one time I was, I was trying to drop a play, uh, and I just got, I, I got upset about something. I don't know if a kid wasn't listening, but I kind of threw the pen down on the, on the thing, and it went flying somewhere. So the next time out comes, and I'm trying to draw up the play, and I'm like, hey, guys, where's my pen? And one of the people in the stands is like, you threw it last time out, coach. Like, <laughs> yeah, I did. All right, girls, go out and play hard. And I just, I would I'd get so mad because all I wanted to do was win. When I'm playing cards with my kids, all I want to do is win. I'll cheat. It's okay. I'm, and everything in me says it doesn't matter what else happens as long as I win. And I remember the last game that I coached, uh, it, was, it was a regional game, and we were playing a conference a, a team from our conference, and I just wanted to win so bad, and we lost. And I got into the car afterwards, and I, I was with my wife and my kids, and I got to thinking, like, this is not a consolation prize. To get into this car and be with these awesome women right now, this is better than having won that basketball game. Sometimes we don't, we don't realize what we actually need. We think we need something that we don't need. And Jesus wants us to to understand what he understands. I want you to think about, again, think about this woman with this disease. All she wanted was a physical healing. That's all she felt she needed. She wanted this bleeding to stop. But Jesus actually wanted something even better for her. While he's saying, yeah, you've got this physical bleeding, but there's a different kind of bleeding that, that's your real issue. It's a spiritual issue. You're bleeding spiritually. And I want to change that. Jesus didn't want this woman to go away thinking that, it was that, that it was some superstitious thing that caused her to be healed. You have to understand, for, for people back in, in, in this time, there was a superstition that they believed that, is, that a person's power went into their clothing. That's part of the reason why this woman said, I just got to touch his clothes and I'll be okay. Jesus wanted her to realize that the faith that she had put in Jesus it wasn't the superstitious part of it that had healed her. It was God. It was the, her faith in God. And so when he said, your faith has healed you, the actual translation for that word healed, sometimes in the New Testament, that same word is translated as saved. He is trying to say, it's your faith that has saved you. But beyond just the physical saving, it saved you spiritually. He's saying, you can go in peace and freedom. No matter... I'm going to be gone from your town in a few days, but you're going to still be able to have this faith that heals you, a kind of healing that lasts. He wanted this woman to realize it was about her faith. It was a faith that didn't require any superstition. It was a faith that didn't care about whether she came to God clean or unclean. It was a faith that was going to give her true and undeserved grace every single time. But Jesus wanted her to see that he was the best answer for every situation, every scenario in her life, not just this issue of bleeding for 12 years. You see, Jesus' answers for us, they are eternal. They're not just temporary. And that's one thing that I love about, there's a story in the Old Testament, one of my favorite stories, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three boys, they were told, you need to stop worshiping your God or you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And essentially what it came down to is they said, hey, even if you throw us in that furnace, we believe our God is going to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're still going to follow God. They understood that there was something 
more significant than just the here and now. There was something eternal about God, that, that he gives us something in, in eternity that, that's beyond anything we could have here. There are people in your life who simply don't need just a physical healing or financial independence or a promotion at work or someone in their life who will love them. What people need more than anything else in this life is a savior who will offer them peace in the moments where the good things don't happen. Are we desperate to show Jesus, show people that kind of Jesus? This Jesus who who's really all that we need in life and has eternal answers that are better than the temporary answers. I want to go back to this story one last time uh, that, that we read here. And, and I want to go back to the very beginning. I, I had read that first sentence that said, so Jesus went with him. And I gave you no context as to who this him was or anything like that. But let's go back to that. Who, who was it that, that Jesus was walking with? Who was this him that we're talking about? Well, it's a, it's a guy by the name of Jairus. Now, I looked on the, on the internet to see if it was Jairus or Jairus. I got both ways to say it. So I'm going to just say Jairus for the, the rest of this time today, okay? But it's this guy named Jairus, and he is he's a, he's a really important dude. He's a, a leader in the synagogue. And he had just come to Jesus minutes before this woman gets to him. And he came humbly. He came down, and he fell down on his knees before Jesus. He said, Jesus, you've got to come to my house. My daughter is dying. She is she is." On the verge of death, will you please come to my house and heal her? And so that's exactly what Jesus does. I can't imagine being Jairus. I can't imagine what he's going through. I can't imagine the turmoil that this guy is going through seeing his daughter like this. But what I can imagine is I can't imagine the urgency that Jairus has, the immediacy that he has of wanting Jesus to get to his house and to heal his daughter. But then... This bloody woman comes and takes up Jesus' time. And I'm not saying that in the that like English-British swearing version of it. That's, she was actually bloody, okay? But she, he's got to be ticked at her at this point. Like, Jesus, get to my house. My daughter is dying. And actually, you see that with the disciples. The disciples were, were actually, they were, they were kind of like, Jesus, what are you doing? For a guy that they're supposed to follow no matter what, he's their rabbi, they actually kind of questioned Jesus when he said, hey, who touched me? They looked around him and they said, you see the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask, who touched me? You see, the disciples, they were a lot like probably what the secret service is like with the president in a big crowd. They're just trying to push Jesus to this place that he's supposed to get to. They're trying to push him along to this girl who, who is dying. The disciples were, were concerned with getting Jesus to Jairus', Jairus daughter, Because it was the place where a real emergency existed. They only saw that girl as the real emergency at this point. So we've been talking about who's your one. Well, Jesus' one on that day actually wasn't the woman who was bleeding. Jesus' one, the one that he was concerned about, was actually Jairus' daughter. But what's so fascinating to me as I look at this story is Jesus was willing to stop for this bleeding woman when he was trying to get to somebody else. The woman was not Jesus' first concern, but she still mattered. Jesus is more than capable of of helping out more than one person at a time. You and me are actually more than capable of, of giving our energy to more than one thing at a time. I love how Jesus was sensitive to what God was trying to do in the people's lives around him. To the point that he was willing to stop for for this woman when there was a girl dying just down the road. So I want to tell you what that means for for each of us personally. You are not insignificant. I know that that sounds incredibly trivial, and it's like, yeah, I know I'm not. The, The church tells me I'm not insignificant all the time. But the truth is, is if we think about the way that we think about life and the way that we pray, we act as though we're insignificant to God. I think I can't, like, I'm not going to pray about that because God has so many other things that he's, that he's got to worry about. Why should I, I've got a, uh, uh, somebody that I know, his wife, uh, he's a pastor in Minneapolis, his wife, they're giving her just days to live right now, and she's, they've got five kids. And I think about, you know, what, why should I pray about anything in my life when God's got that to, to contend with? But the truth is, is you are not insignificant. What's going on in your life is not insignificant. 
Jesus stopped for a bleeding woman when there was a girl dying just down the road. Now, did he stop for this woman to the detriment of this girl? Well, what happens is as they, as they start to walk back towards, towards Jairus' house, somebody comes, a, a servant comes of Jairus and says, Jairus, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. And Jesus looks at him, says, don't worry, she's asleep. She goes to the house. What does he do? He, he brings her back to life. God can take the time for any person that he wants to, for any issue that he wants to, and he still has time to do everything else that he needs to do. You are not insignificant to God. Your needs are not insignificant to God. Your eternity matters more than anything to God. Jesus still felt that small tug of faith on his, on his robe that day. He still feels your small tug of faith on his robe. He still feels your neighbor's small tug of faith on his, on his robe. And here's the thing. He wants us to be a part of helping him out with that. You see, this woman had an incurable disease. Nobody could cure it in that day. And you and I, we have an incurable disease too. And that disease is sin. And Jesus went and died on a cross. He paid a, he paid a penalty. He paid a price to cure our incurable disease. He went out of his way for that. To take off that weight of our sin from our shoulders. And while you may feel the weight of the world on your shoulders at times, here's the cool thing. You and I, we get to be like Jesus. We get to help other people when the weight of the world is on them. I think the best thing that we can do when we look at the story of Jesus, the best thing that we can do is never treat any moment or any individual as if, that person or that moment is insignificant. Treat every moment as though it's a moment that actually might stand out in the eternal landscape of someone else's story. Treat every moment as though it's a moment where Jesus is maybe wanting to show somebody a little bit more of who he is. That's why we focus on our one. That's why we focus on that person that God has put on our heart. But we, don't, we also don't have to just focus on that one. When Jesus brings another one into our life, while we're focusing on that one, he still gives us the ability to give care and to give time to that person. Sometimes you're going to be the one that, that needs something from Jesus. You need an encounter with Jesus. I think what Jesus wants to do for us more than anything is, I think he wants to show us over and over and over again, time and time and time again, just how absolutely significant we are to him. And likewise, I think he wants us to show other people how significant they are to him. And so as we're closing up here, uh, worship team, you guys can come up. Um, as we're closing up here, I want us to, to just ask God to do something in our lives. I want us to ask God to help us have the sensitivity to know those moments where somebody is, has got that tug of faith going in their lives that we would have that sensitivity to understand when somebody needs attention, like Jesus gave attention to this woman who was bleeding. Maybe it's, maybe it's they're tugging on the, on, that, on, the fo- on the cloak of Jesus. Maybe they're tugging on our cloak for some reason. But let's ask God to give us the sensitivity to see those moments. And then let's ask God to, to help us not to be so quick to move past those moments, to take time for people the way that Jesus took time for this woman. Why don't you pray with me?